from 12 News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. I'm alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi, and our guest this week is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Treasurer, it's good to have you back in studio again. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, Treasurer, I want to start with a pension system you don't control. Uh, Providence is proposing taking out a $704 million bond to get their pension fund from about 22% funded uh, to more than 60% funded. So, essentially, borrowing toward a liability. Look, we're always told you shouldn't pay off one credit card with another. Is that what would be happening here in your view? So Mayor Lorza just uh, called me two days ago to tell me about this plan. I requested a uh, more detailed briefing, which uh, I believe is scheduled for next week. So I'm going to withhold judgment until I've actually seen the details of the plan. Do you um, wish he had? Said, do you wish he had called you a little bit earlier? Uh, sure, but you know what I'll say is I'm going to withhold judgment until I see the details. Uh, but of course, you know pension obligation bonds are uh, you know well known and and have a mixed track record nationally. Um, it's viewed by many people as being a uh, a risky strategy, uh, very much uh, at the heart of the Detroit bankruptcy, the Stockton, California bankruptcy. Uh, didn't go well in Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Uh, has worked in other places. So, you know, I'd say we've got to be cautious here. It's, um, you know, it's a strategy that's viewed by many people as risky. It has a mixed track record. Uh, but I'm going to keep an open mind until I actually see the details of the plan. What would your role in this be? Do you, would you have to sign off on it, or would it be more advisory? Well, ultimately, uh, the General Assembly and I imagine the City Council would have to sign off. Um, but as Treasurer, I've always taken an active interest in the financial security of all of Rhode Island's cities and towns. Uh, we've strengthened oversight of locally administered pension plans uh, since I took office as treasurer. And actually, I worked very closely a couple years ago with the city of Central Falls and then Mayor Diosa uh, to put a plan together to strengthen uh, that city's pension system, which had also been struggling. You know, we brought all of the stakeholders together. We negotiated some concessions from the unions. Uh, we negotiated an arrangement where actually our office has taken over management of the investments and the administration of the pension plan. Um, I have to credit Mayor Diosa and now Mayor Rivera. You know, they were great leaders in that process. So we have taken an active role in trying to help communities uh, strengthen their finances, including their pension plans. Um, you know, I'm not familiar yet with the details of the Providence proposal, and uh, once I get up to speed, I'll form an opinion. Well, let me tell you a little what we heard yesterday at the briefing. They, 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 they in Providence, almost described it as a can't-miss strategy. They say, look, we're going to borrow $704 million, around 4%. And historically, the market always does a couple points better than that. Yeah. Uh, so we lower how much we have to put in, put toward pensions for now. We'll get more than that out of the market. We'll pay off the debt, and you know everybody's happy. I mean, it, 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 it did, they didn't sound like they saw any downsides to this. Yeah. Well, listen, the history is mixed. You know, when other places have done this, right? Um, there are other cities around the country and a couple of states where that has borne out, right? You float a bond at a low interest rate, you invest the money and earn more, and you know you come out on top. Uh, but there are also places where it has not worked out well, where because of the timing, you know, a city like Detroit or Stockton borrowed a whole bunch of money, invested it at the wrong time, you know, maybe right before a market crash. Um, you know, the investment bankers made a lot of money off of fees, uh, but ultimately the communities didn't do well. Um, Woonsocket is another example. So, you know, there are risks associated with this. Doesn't necessarily mean that it can't work. There are places where it has, but we got to be cautious. And I want to make sure that I really understand the details uh, of what the mayor is proposing uh, before uh, forming an opinion. But I do expect to form an opinion. More broadly, you know, whether this is the right uh, plan or not, I just, I'm just curious, you know, how do you view? the scale of the problem in Providence Pension. I mean, they gave us the latest numbers yesterday. $1.2 billion shortfall. That's double the annual, almost double the annual budget. Um, it's going up at like, going to go up at 5% a year, how much they have to put into the pension fund. I mean, it's the capital city, um, obviously a place that needs a lot of investment and other things. I mean, do you think something has to happen? Oh, no doubt. I mean, the Providence pension is the biggest financial problem that the state of Rhode Island faces. Um, I've been saying that for years. Uh, I gave a presentation to the Providence City Council a couple years ago uh, where I outlined the problem and 
presented a menu of possible options uh, for the council and the mayor to consider to address the Providence pension uh, issue. Um, so it is a problem. Um, but again, I, I haven't seen the details of this plan yet. And what we do know is that pension obligation bonds have a mixed track record. Sometimes they've worked out, sometimes they've ended disastrously. And so I really want to understand the details of this plan um, before, uh, before weighing in on whether we should do it or not. The menu of options you gave city leaders, I assume, floating a bond was not among them, correct? It was not. Okay. Um, look, should the Providence Pension Fund be managed by the state like other, some other muni municipalities that are in MERS? And, and just as a sort of secondary question there, if they were able to boost the funding to 60% through a bond, would that better its chances from, uh, you know, to be managed by the state? Well, listen, uh, our office manages over 100 municipal pension plans in Rhode Island through this MERS system, and those plans are doing very well. You know, the average funding status of a municipal plan that we manage is over 80%. And there's a series of reasons for that, more professional management, better investment performance. You know, the state uh, pension system has outperformed the city of Providence on investments four fiscal years in a row now. Um, so I think many communities could benefit from a more professional management that comes from being part of a larger system. That's why when we negotiated the fixes to the Central Falls pension a couple years ago, that was part of that plan uh, that we negotiated to help move the Central Falls pension in a more sustainable direction. Um, so that is one of the options that I think should be on the table. But um, r regardless, uh, you know, we need to be careful in how we vet uh, this pension obligation bond proposal because you know, again, it's, it's a strategy that many people view as risky. Hopefully people brewed strong coffee this morning for newsmakers. Uh, with <laughs> you all guys let off, right, yeah, with yeah, pensions. Exactly. But was, it's important. It's a it, lot of money. It, it, yeah. Yes. Um, so let's talk about the pension plans you manage, um, which are the state ones. You just yeah. alluded to the municipal ones you oversee. But, uh, you know, I was looking at the numbers. This, is, this year, 2011, will mark 10 years since then-Treasurer Raimondo's big pension overhaul passed. And when I look at the state employees plan, which is one of the plans, one of the two biggest plans, the funding level is actually down slightly since 2011. It was at 57 and 11, it's at 54% now. And yes, you could say, well, it would have been worse, et cetera, but when are Rhode Islanders gonna see real improvement in the funding levels of these pension plans we're at when we're a decade past such a huge overhaul? Well, we already are improving, and let me take a step back here. This is important because every Rhode Islander deserves retirement security, and especially those Rhode Islanders who have spent their lives serving the community as teachers, as nurses, as first responders. And you know, I'm pleased to report that the pension system is trending in a positive direction. Our unfunded liability has dropped two years in a row. Last year dropped by over $100 million. Our funded status has gone up three years in a row. The Back to Basics investment plan that I launched for the pension system back in 2016 is performing well. We outperformed 87% of our peers nationally last year on investment performance. And just this month, we hit $10 billion in assets under management for the first time. And as a result of that strong performance, every retiree in the plan is getting a cost of living adjustment this year. Then why so the plan is trending the in the right direction. Is, we, well, you don't see much evidence of yeah. it in the funding level. Well, we made a decision a few years ago to adopt more accurate uh, accounting assumptions for the pension plan. Uh, including lowering the assumed rate of return for the plan. You see, for years, one of the reasons that many places, including Rhode Island, got into trouble originally was because they were using loose accounting to make their plan look healthier than it really was. And when you do that, yeah, things look better on paper, but over time you dig yourself deeper and deeper into the hole. So we made the decision a few years ago to adopt more accurate and honest assumptions uh, for the pension plan that had the effect of revealing the true status of uh, the funding status of the plan. Prior to that, uh, it was being reported at an inflated level because the actuarial assumptions were not uh, realistic. And so, you know, I, I would again challenge uh, this notion that there hasn't been improvement. There has. Um, we've adopted more realistic actuarial assumptions. Our unfunded liability is going down. Our funded status is trending up. We've outperformed a majority of our peers uh, in investment performance three years in a row. And uh, we're now at an all-time high. As a result, we're able to deliver things like a cost of living adjustment for retirees for the first time in years. But so we are trending in the right direction. 60% has been the critical status number for the state. When yeah. will the state employees plan finally be at 60%? 
oh, well, we will be there within a few years. I mean, we're trending in that direction. Again, the funded status has gone up three years in a row ever since we adopted the more realistic uh, accounting assumptions. Treasurer, you announced the Rhode Island Pension Fund would divest from companies that produce and distribute fossil fuels by this summer. Uh, if those companies do well yeah. and the pension fund doesn't do as well as it could have because you divested uh, from those funds, does that mean you ignored your primary fiduciary responsibility to the state? No, not a, listen. My obligation as treasurer is to deliver strong investment performance and retirement security for the 60,000 members of the pension fund. And everyone will tell you that the future of our economy globally is a clean energy economy. That's the direction that we're heading in, right? We are heading in a direction where renewable energy is ramping up and where the legacy fossil fuel industry is phasing out. And as investors, we have to be forward looking. You know, we have to be forward looking and invest based on where things are headed, not based on where they've been. So we did announce uh, recently that uh, the pension fund's fossil fuel exposure will be decreased by 50% this summer since when I took off, compared to when I took office. Um, that's a good thing. It means that we are investing in the industries of the future rather than in the past. And again, I'll just remind everyone, we have outperformed our peers. We have performed better than a majority of other public pension funds three years in a row. Last year, we outperformed 87% of public pension plans nationally. So we are outperforming at the same time that we're moving in a more sustainable direction. I want to ask you about uh, some of the stuff that's being debated on Smith Hill regarding the budget. You spoke to the Small Business Committee a few months ago with some ideas on improving the economy. One of the topics that that's, there's a lot of back and forth about is it's kind of two parts. It involves taxes. One, the governor wants to tax PPP loans that were forgiven that are over $150,000. And also his budget uh, does not exclude taxation on the first 10000 or so of unemployment benefits the way the feds are doing. Some lawmakers are saying both of those should be done differently. I'm curious what your view is. Yeah, I don't think that we should be taxing uh, small businesses on their PPP loans or uh, taxing those individuals who earned unemployment benefits last year. You know, we need to be supporting small businesses as they try to recover through this pandemic. We need to be supporting workers who are displaced. And, you know, I think the Boston Globe reported, uh, we are, as it stands under the governor's plan, one of only three states in the whole country that would be taxing both PPP loan forgiveness for small businesses and uh, unemployment benefits for, um, uh, for displaced workers. Uh, Rhode Island should not be an outlier like that. It sends the wrong message particularly to those small businesses who are struggling. And you know what really convinced me of this more than anything was, if you actually look at the list of small businesses that received more than 150,000 worth of emergency PPP funding, um, there are a lot of small mom and pop businesses on that list, donut shops and small restaurants and hair salons and small manufacturers and now the argument the governor's made is that look you know these just by virtue of qualifying for that much money and having it yeah. forgiven these are pretty sizable businesses that have done pretty well um, because that's why they have this this income to report yeah but listen we're trying to help businesses in Rhode Island recover and expand again hire more invest in the business bring people back to work get our economy going again and you know I do not think it is the right move. It does not send the right message to increase taxes on small businesses by $70 million as we are coming out of a pandemic where small businesses took a huge hit. All right, we're going to take a break on Newsmakers. When we come back, the treasurer toured the troubled uh, Zamborano Hospital. What did he see there? And is he running for governor? We'll ask. Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White alongside 12 News Politics Editor Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Treasurer, just going to ask you, everyone's talking about it, are you running for governor in 2022? Well, a lot of people are encouraging me to run for governor, and I am actively thinking about it. And you know, I'll walk you through my thought process. I've been thinking a lot lately about um, my grandfathers who were sons of immigrants. My grandfather, Bob, was a uh, son of Irish immigrants in Worcester. My grandfather, Lewis, was a uh, son of Jewish immigrants in New York. And 
like a lot of men in their generation, they went and fought in the war. They didn't have a lot of money. They grew up poor. They didn't have a lot of education. But when they got home from the war, they were able to get good jobs. Bob was a steel worker. Lewis was a bookkeeper. And with those jobs, they were able to get uh, buy houses. They were able to start families and put their kids through college, my parents. My parents then met. They started a business here in Rhode Island. They were successful. They built a life for me and my siblings that my grandfathers never could have dreamed of. And the reason that I think about this as a, in the context of this decision for what I'm going to do next is, you know, that story used to be very common, that American dream story of families working hard, doing the right thing, and building a better life for their kids than they had for themselves. And that American dream, that mobility, has broken down. The data shows it, and people feel it. So what I care about and what I've devoted my time in government to is doing everything that I can to build an economy in Rhode Island that restores that promise, that restores that American dream, so that you know families who are willing to work hard and do the right thing can build a better life for themselves and their kids. That is broken down in this country and in this state. Um, I want to do something about that. And so you know, I'm actively considering what I'm going to do next. I'm looking hard at running for governor because I want to ensure that every family is able to have what my family and so many others have in building that American dream for themselves. When do you have to make a decision by? Uh, I expect to make a decision shortly. Oh, sure. Okay. And are you going to do the whole, like, would you do the, I'm ex exploratory committee, but I'm not really running yet, and then we have to, like, write our articles weirder? Will you just say that you're running if you I, decide to run? <laughs> I, I haven't gotten to that point in the thought process. I mean, listen, I, I, uh, where I am in my thought process is really doing some deep thinking about how can I best restore that American dream in Rhode Island? You know, American dream that has broken down, that, you know, doesn't exist to the same extent that it used to. And that for many people, you know, particularly communities of color, never really existed to begin with, right? And so uh, that's the thinking that I'm doing right now. Uh, it's a big decision, and, um, you know, I expect to make a decision How soon. How much is the decision changed by the fact that there's now an incumbent Democratic governor mm -hmm. uh, because of Gina Raimondo leaving, Dan McKee taking over? I mean, I know the the conventional wisdom at the state house is your path just got significantly harder because you're running against an incumbent potentially yeah. rather than an open seat. Yeah, no, my, my thought process is entirely about what can I do to help lift Rhode Islanders up, to restore that American dream, um, and to you know build a real 21st century economy in Rhode Island where there's opportunity for everybody. You know, if we're going to do that, we need to make smart investments. We need to prioritize economic growth. We need to step away from the old school style politics that held Rhode Island back for so long. And that's the type of leadership I brought to the treasurer's office over the last six and a half years. So my thought process is entirely, uh, what can I do next to help get Rhode Island to a place where everyone who's willing to work hard can have a chance at success? Just one more question on this, because you know, when people come on who might run for governor, I like to ask about things that will become part of their portfolio. You mentioned your grandfathers and being able to buy a house. Yeah. You are the only millennial among the uh, general officers and federal officers in Rhode Island. I'm a millennial also. I'm sure you, like me, are hearing horror stories from people in their 30s like us, desperate to buy a house, mm -hmm. who are finding 50 people at an opening. They're getting outbid by $50,000. And yet it's hard to see how that's going to change because you still see huge resistance to increasing the housing supply in Rhode Island. And so yeah. it seems like that's going to be a top issue for whoever is the next governor. What do you think should be done about that? Well, there's a few things, because you're absolutely right. Housing is foundational to building a strong economy in Rhode Island, right? And so, you know, we need to increase our supply of affordable housing and workforce housing. Um, I supported uh, the housing bond on the ballot this past year. I campaigned for it. We need more of that. But, but we know, also need to, but we also need to incentivize uh, cities and towns to allow more development. You know, doing it in a way that's, you know, follows environmental regulations, all the rest. But at the end of the day, uh, we can't let parochial politics and nimbyism hold us back from, you know, building a housing stock that, that, can, um, you know, that can adequately serve Rhode Islanders. So, no, I do think that the state needs to play a more active role, yes, in providing more funding for housing, uh, but also in incentivizing cities and towns to allow more development. Kathy Gregg at the Providence Journal had a story lately pointing out that you've been very visible lately, and the head of the state GOP uh, said that you were leveraging your general office job to run for elected office, for run for governor. How do you yeah. respond to that? Well, my focus as treasurer has been on building a 21st century economy for Rhode Island. So here are some of the things that we've been doing. 
lately. Um, I led a statewide school construction task force that put together a once in a generation plan to fix school buildings all across Rhode Island. Last week, we announced a progress report on that school construction program. We've allocated funding already to fix or replace 163 school buildings serving 80,000 students. Those projects are going to create 20,000 jobs. We also started a program to help small Church, businesses get I'm actually going to interrupt you, and I'm sorry, yeah. I opened you up to a whole platform pitch <laughs> on that answer there. So I'm going to stop you because I want to talk about that. I yeah. want to talk about the, the, the school report that, that came out. Um, as you point out, 163 schools have uh, been either approved you know, or rebuilt. Or, okay, thanks. Um, but, you know, I remember the Jacobs report in 2017 that was sponsored by Ride, and that was devastating. Something like 50,000, right, deficiencies across all of the schools. Yeah. So when you say 163, where are we in terms of how far along? Yeah, so we're only two and a half years into the school construction program that I developed, and that was approved by voters overwhelmingly in 2018. So in two and a half years, We've allocated $1.3 billion to fix or replace 163 schools. That program state still has- State and local money or just state money? Uh, state and local. Uh, about a billion of it is state. The program has another two years left. And so we are still accepting applications from school districts for more projects. Um, but already, I mean, 163 buildings is a majority of the school buildings in Rhode Island. So in just two and a half years, we've allocated funding to make in many cases, transformational improvements to school buildings all across the state. We unveiled this report a couple weeks ago at uh, the new East Providence High School, which is a perfect example. The old East Providence High School, old, falling apart, unsafe, only had one science lab for 1,600 students to share. The new East Providence High School is going to be state of the art. It has a dozen science labs, CTE facilities. That's how we build the workforce of the 21st century and get good jobs in Rhode Island. Your task force, I remember, on the school buildings, I, I, think, they, I think the proposal was borrow $250 million you know, to start the program, spend that, then do another $250 million eventually. Do you, do you still think there will be demand for another $250 million? Well, I think we have to finish the job. So yes, you know, my, my um, belief is that we're going to need to do a second $250 million school construction bond next year so that we can finish the job. Uh, as Tim asked about, you know, we've made great progress in lining up repairs and replacements for 163 buildings, but we still have more to do, so we've got to keep it going. You uh, toured Zamborano Hospital. My colleague, Eli Sherman and I have done a fair amount of reporting on that. We, we filed a report a couple of weeks ago that the state fire marshal found yeah. more than 100 safety violations there, that, you know, ranging in severity. What did you see? What did you experience? You know, I've been up to Zamborano a couple of times, and I've gone because this is a facility that cares for Rhode Islanders who need care the most. You know, for Rhode Islanders, primarily, you know, middle and lower income Rhode Islanders who have serious injuries, spinal cord injuries, serious uh, mental health issues, and have, in many cases, nowhere else to go where they can get that level of care. Um, there's no question the building is the mess. Uh, there have been serious um, allegations around mismanagement of the hospital, around doctors being pressured to discharge patients before they were ready, um, and the list goes on and on. Uh, you know, we need to, everyone in Rhode Island has a stake in finding a solution for Zamborano because these are Rhode Islanders who need it the most. And also, by the way, Zamborano is an important economic anchor for Northwest Rhode Island as well. So I would like to see uh, Zamborano continue to exist in some form to serve those patients who need that care, who have nowhere else to go where they can get comparable care, ideally in a new facility because the old one is, is probably beyond repair. Um, but I'm going to continue to pay attention to this, and all Rhode Islanders should. I'm glad that you're covering it uh, because it is absolutely vital that we care for those in Rhode Island who need it the most. You just got to help get a bill passed, I think it's through the House, maybe not through the Senate yet, uh, on financial literacy and teaching financial literacy classes for all Rhode Island students. Uh, that's it, sort of like civics. You always hear a lot of people say, I wish they taught that in school. You know, How would it work <laughs> if this gets signed into law? Will they hire a financial teacher? Will like some teacher now have to teach a class and it will just be embedded into some other class? Yes. We have one minute left. Yeah. So um, all students should have personal finance education. And in most other states around the country, it is part of their statewide curriculum. So Rhode Island students deserve no less. 
Uh, the bill has now passed the House and the Senate. Okay. They need to pass each other's bills, you know, that whole thing they do. Um, <laughs> the way it would work is um, schools would have flexibility in how to implement it. If schools wanted to have a required standalone personal finance class, they could do it. If they wanted to integrate it into other math or social studies classes, they could do that. They could give students the opportunities to do projects meeting certain standards to meet the requirement. So we want to give educators the flexibility. There's also a provision in the bill to give educa uh, educators resources and professional development. As a public school teacher, formally myself, I know it's important to support teachers when you give them uh, something new to do. and so. Uh, we do have that built into the bill as well, and it'll phase in over a couple of years. In, in 10 seconds, you feeling confident that you'll be marching in the Bristol 4th of Pari uh, July parade? This I, year? I feel highly confident that I will be marching in my hometown of Bristol on the 4th of July. <laughs> All right, General Treasurer Seth Magaziner, thanks so much for joining us on the program. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmakers.